Lord, we, we want to hear your voice tonight. And Lord, we, we pray that your word would be what you promised it was, living and active. Make it living and active in our lives tonight, Lord. Say those things and speak those words into our lives that we need to hear. Amen. Do any of you know what an earworm is? Uh, you, you hear a line from a song and it, it goes in your ear and then you can't get it out of your head. Uh, and it goes round and round and round. It's called an earworm. Well, uh, recently, I wasn't listening to a song. I, a couple of months ago, I was listening to a sermon by an American pastor called Steve Furtrick, and uh, I got an earworm. Uh, he said something that went into my brain, and for a couple of weeks, it, it really played over and over again. This is what he said. He said, too many people allow a scene in their life to become the story of their life. Too many people allow a scene in their life to become the story of their life. And so what he was talking about there was that what happens is someone goes through a crisis, they experience a tragedy, and then that tragedy comes to dominate and define the whole of the rest of their life. And so that tragedy becomes their story. And you probably know people like this, don't you? So someone goes through a messy divorce, and that scene in their story becomes the entirety of their story. Someone loses a loved one, and that scene of bereavement in their life becomes the story of their life. Someone goes through a health crisis and perhaps develops a chronic illness and that scene in their life then becomes the story of their life. And that thought that too many people allow a scene in their life to become the story of their life came back to me this week as we were looking at the Shunammite woman. And I believe that God brought some of us here tonight and some of us to watch online just for the next thing that I'm going to say. It's one of those occasions when I can say to you, if you don't remember anything else about this sermon, remember this. And here it is. That you don't have to allow a tragedy to become your identity. If you've experienced tragedy in your life, if you're in the middle of a crisis right now in your life, God's message to you, to us, is that you don't have to allow a tragedy to become your identity. And the reason that I can say that so confidently is because of the story of this woman that we've been looking at over the last two weeks. So if you can remember, last week we encountered the Shunammite woman, uh, and we were thinking about the fact that in chapter 4 of 2 Kings, her life was in, her faith was in the comfort zone, and that was what we were thinking about last week. But now, in the second half of that story, when we encounter her, her faith is in the crisis zone. Her faith goes through a real crisis. What happens was, we, we heard it last week, her son, who's probably a teenager by now, is working in the fields with his father, and suddenly he takes ill. And then his dad is a typical dad. Uh, when the child gets ill, what does he do? He sends it to his mother. And there, the tragedy happens. In her arms, her son dies. Can you imagine how she felt? This precious child that had been a gift from God that she'd never expected and how much she'd loved it and there in her very arms, it died. What a crisis. As a, as a parent, I cannot imagine a worse crisis. 
than your child dying in your arms. And you know, we don't have to imagine how she felt because she tells us. We're told that she was in bitter distress about it. And that means that she was grief-stricken and angry. In the original Hebrew, probably the, the best translation of what she was feeling is an old English word called vexed. She was vexed in her soul. And it is a mixture of feeling grief-stricken and angry. Wonder if something's happened to you. You've gone through a crisis in your life and it's left you feeling vexed in your soul. And she was disappointed with God when she finally gets to Elisha. She says, didn't I ask for a son, Lord? Didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes. She was feeling disappointed and let down by God. She felt that God had raised her hopes by giving her a child only to dash them again when the boy died. And there she is. She's in a crisis. And her soul is vexed. And her faith is shaken. And she's feeling angry and disappointed with God. And by the way, it's okay to feel angry and disappointed with God. Read the Psalms. It's full of people feeling angry and disappointed with God. He's got broad shoulders. And that's where we find her. Maybe that's where you find yourself right now. But you know, sooner or later, every single one of us is going to go through a crisis that will vex our souls came across this uh, quote by Edith Schaefer. She said, affliction must be acknowledged as something that we all need to deal with. There is no place that we can go for a vaccination from the abnormality of the universe, from the effects of sin on every area of life and from the conflict of the ages. Jesus warned us that persecution and affliction are a normal part of Christian life. Praise the Lord that we got a vaccination for covid But let me tell you, there is no vaccination from the tragedies of life. We can't be vaccinated from the crises that come from us being sinners living in a fallen world. And things are going to come and they're going to happen to you that's going to vex your soul and shake your faith. But here's what I want to tell you, based on the experience of this woman, of hundreds of other characters in the Word of God, and tens of millions of Christians down 2,000 years. Crises are inevitable, but they are survivable. Crises might be inevitable, Francis Schaeffer is right, or Edith Schaeffer, sorry, but they're also survivable. You can make it through. She made it through the crisis, and you can make it through the crisis. Tragedy didn't become her story, and it doesn't have to be your story either. Tragedy does not have to become your identity. You can make it through whatever you're going through in life right now. That's the Psalm 23 promise, isn't it? God promises in Psalm 23, when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will camp with you in it. No, that's not the promise. The promise is I will walk with you through it. That the crisis with God alongside us, is survivable. We can make it through. But how? That's the question. How do we make it through that crisis so the tragedy doesn't become our identity? So a scene in the story doesn't become the whole story of our life. How do we do that? Has this woman anything to tell us? I think she does. Because you see, every time we experience a crisis, every time we have a tragedy touch our life, we have a choice. 
A crisis will either drive you away from God or draw you closer to God. A crisis will either stretch your faith to breaking point or strengthen your faith. And you get to choose. And I want to encourage you, in fact, I I don't want to encourage you, I want to beg you to make the choice that this woman made. When her son died, she could have buried him. She could have turned her back on God. And tragedy could have become her identity. That scene in her life could have become the story of her whole life. But that's not what she did. She made a different choice. There's lots of things in this story I don't understand. I don't understand when her husband asks her what's happened, she says, everything's fine, when her son's just died. I don't understand when Elijah's servant asks her what's happening, she says, everything's fine. But I do understand one thing. I do know one thing for certain. Tragedy drove her into the arms of God. Tragedy drew her closer to God rather than pushing her away. Now you have to remember, Elisha is a prophet. He's a man of God. He represents God to her. So what does she do? She goes to him as quickly as she can. And when she gets there, she clings on to him. And her outward actions are revealing what's happening to her inwardly. She turns to God and holds on. And some things are going to happen to us in life and we'll discover the only thing that we have to hold on to is God. But here's something great. Here's something not to miss. Here's another one of these truths that you need to remember if you don't remember anything else. When we hold on to God, we are upheld by God. And that's so important. I want to make sure we've all got it. Don't leave here tonight not knowing that when we hold on to God, we are upheld by God. Just listen to David's testimony when he was in a tragedy. He says in Psalm 63, I cling on to your strong right hand. And your strong right hand holds me securely. He discovered in the midst of that crisis, when he held on to God, he was upheld by God. And if there's one piece of advice I've got for you from the Shunammite woman, it's to do what she does in a crisis. To go to God and hold on. And when you do that, you'll discover that you're upheld by God. And I know that some of us are going through some really tough, difficult stuff right now. And God's saying to us, come, hold on to me and I'll uphold you. But sometimes we think, yeah, sounds great in a sermon, but... In my life, does this stuff work? That's why we showed the video of Horatio Stafford. Can you imagine a more tragic wife? Loses his only son. All of his money goes up in smoke. Four of his children die. But he held on to God and he was upheld with God. And he was able to write, when sorrows like a sea billow roll, whatever my lot, there was taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And so what have we learned from the Shunammite women so far? We've learned that a tragedy does not have to become our identity, but a Something else equally important that builds on that that we need to learn. And it's that God can use our tragedy to give us a story. God can use your tragedy 
to give you a story. Again, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff here I just don't understand. I don't understand the significance of Elisha sending his staff on ahead and then putting it on the dead boy's body. I don't understand why he has to lie on him twice when he could just have prayed. don't understand any of that stuff. What I do understand is that God raised that child from the dead. And here's what happened. God used that to give that woman a story. Now, nearly all the sermons that I hear on the Shunammite woman end in chapter 4, but her story doesn't end in chapter 4. It ends in chapter 8 that we had read to us earlier. And so we catch up with the Shunammite woman in chapter 8, and what we discover is she's gone through another crisis. There's been a famine in the land, and to escape starvation, she's become a refugee. And when she comes back, her land has been stolen. So she goes straight to the top. She goes to the king. You get the impression that this is a pretty self-confident, go-getter kind of woman. And then you've just got to love God's timing, haven't you? God's timing. Sometimes we wish it would be earlier, but it's always bang on. Just as she's arriving, the king is saying to Elijah's servant, Tell me the great things that God's done through Elisha. And you can imagine the servant saying, you're never going to believe this story. There was this woman, and she had a son, and the son died, and, and just as he's about to hit the punchline, who walks through the door but the woman and her son? Just at the right moment. This is the woman and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. Now it's the next bit that I want you to pay attention to. The king asked the woman about it and she told him. Do you see what happened? She had a story about what God had done for her. So God gave her a story from her tragedy to bring him glory. God used her tragedy to give her a story to bring him glory. And that's what he wants to do for us too. He wants to give us a story for our tragedy that will bring him glory. We don't remember her as the woman who tragically lost a son. That's in her life didn't become her story. That tragedy didn't become her identity. Instead, God used it to give her a story. She was the mother of the child that was brought back from the dead. And that's the final message. God can use your tragedy, what you've experienced, what you're experiencing, what you will experience. He can use your tragedy to give you a story that will bring him glory. Now, he does that in two ways. Sometimes he miraculously changes the circumstances. And so he raised her child from the dead. And I know people who've got a story today that in the midst of illness, God gave them a story of healing. And so that's the first way. Sometimes God gives a tragedy a story by changing the circumstances. But the second way is that God changes us in the circumstances. So do you remember Paul? Paul's testimony in 2 Corinthians 12 is that he had a chronic illness, a painful chronic illness. A thorn in the flesh. Now, did he allow that scene to become his story? Do we remember Paul simply as the man who had a thorn in his flesh? No, we remember him as someone that God gave a story. He said, I've discovered that your grace is sufficient for your power is perfected in my weakness. God's grace is sufficient. And you know, I've seen this happen so often. I've seen God give people with an addiction a story of freedom. 
I've seen God give people with a broken heart a story of joy. I've seen God give people who have been left feeling unloved and unlovable a story of self-esteem and self-worth. I've seen God give people who have been deeply, deeply hurt by others a story of forgiveness. I've seen people who have been estranged from others and God gives them a story of reconciliation. I've seen people who have, got, who have been gripped by anxiety and God's given them a story of peace. And I want to end by introducing you to a man called Daniel Ritchie. The reason that I want to introduce Daniel Ritchie to you is that he sums up everything that we've been talking about tonight. His life reminds us that you don't need to let a tragedy become your identity. You don't need to let a scene in your story to become the whole story of your life. And that God can use a tragedy to give you a story for his glory. And as you watch Daniel Ritchie and his story, I want you to remember that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And whatever he did for the Shunammite woman, whatever he did for Horatio Stafford, whatever he's done for Daniel Ritchie, he can do it for you. So let's hear the story of Daniel Ritchie. Listen, I know that these days are full of uncertainty and fear and isolation. And that's something that, that y'all, I not only know in this time, alongside all of us that are, that are suffering and dealing uh, with this world that the coronavirus has brought us, but this is also a life that I've lived literally since day one. And being born without arms, from moment one, my life was nothing but uncertain. No one knew what, what my life was gonna look like in the years to come. There was plenty of fear as if I, I was going to amount to anything. And then there was total isolation, not knowing anybody else that had to live a life like I lived. But what God in his grace did in my teens is that he rescued and he redeemed me through the grace of his gospel. He gave me an identity, a hope, a strength that I couldn't possibly have, even if I had two hands. And what God has done is he has taken my weakness and as Paul says in Corinthians, that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. And so what I've realized through these years is God has not only given me a strength and a hope, but he's given me an opportunity in the midst of my pain. God has given me a platform to speak to hope that goes beyond circumstances. And in our world that we live in right now, y'all, the world is looking for hope. You can see it everywhere. You can see it in the look in people's eyes. You can see it in how people interact on social media. The world is desperately searching for hope. And what God has done is he has given us an opportunity now to speak to that hope and to use our pain as a platform to point people to his power. So we're going to end with that old hymn that embodies what we've been talking about tonight. And I, I want to invite you to, uh, some of us, to sing it as a testimony. Some of us need to sing it in faith that God can do that for us too. And uh, I'm aware that some of the stuff we've talked about tonight maybe raises difficult issues for you. And if you would like someone to pray with you, if you came to the front at the end, we'd be delighted to do that. But let's tell God that we believe that tragedy doesn't have to be our identity and that God can use that tragedy to give us a story that brings him glory. Patience. Patience.